You are listening to PT on Ice, the older adult, a collaboration between the Senior Rehab Project and the Institute of Clinical Excellence. This is a rebroadcast of an original episode that can be found at ptonice.com. Good morning, PT on Ice crew. My name is Dustin Jones. I am a faculty member with the Institute of Clinical Excellence in the Older Adult Division. I teach modern management of the older adult with Christina Previtt. We had our week six wrap up last night, uh, which is why we're speeding through this course. Uh, at, it, it seems like a very fast pace. These weeks just go by very, very quickly. Uh, but we had an awesome discussion last night where we talked about cognitive decline. We talked about loaded carries. We talked about communication, cueing, feedback, all these different topics. Uh, but one thing that came up was death and dying. And I figured I'd talk about it this morning. Uh, this um, is obviously a difficult topic <laughs> to address. It's very a difficult t- topic for me to talk about um, just because I'm, I'm a 32-year-old physical therapist about to have my first kid, just kind of, you know, <clears throat> relatively in a good stage of life. And I, I, I want to realize and acknowledge how um, naive I am to this topic, how I've not lived uh, long enough to experience some of the hardships that many of you all have faced to so listen to this podcast or others. So I know my perspective on on death and dying is very limited, um, but I do just want to talk about this stuff on this platform because I feel like we do need to address some of these uh, harder subjects um, ourselves, but then also, you know, be able to talk about that with our patients and ultimately, you know, provide a better uh, experience and service to the people that we serve, which is our patients. Um, uh, right after this, I'm going to be going to a funeral uh, back home in West Virginia. So this has just kind of been been on my mind. So we'll we'll do our best today. Uh, but I just wanted to give kind of a little bit of perspective for a lot of you all that may be, uh, you know, you may be working with some older adults, but that may not be the, the majority of your patient population. You know, let's say you're in a, a nice little outpatient uh, clinic where you've got a diverse group of people. You got your high school athletes that you see. You got your weekend warriors. And then you may have, you know, some of those older adults or, or Medicare patients, as some like to call them, that are filling those midday slots. Uh, I just want you to think about some of the, the life transitions that they may be experiencing. Think about some of your patients that have had long careers in a specific type of trade that are now uh, not able to do that job anymore. They may have transitioned into, you know, some, some form of retirement. Um, where they they are not able to do or not choosing to do what they used to do uh, before. Um, some of your patients may have, have started to lose some of their best friends, um, some of their family uh, due to some type of illness, or you know some people just lived a, lo- a long life and have passed away. Uh, that is something uh, that that's is literally staring at a lot of our patients right in the face that they have to confront with. Some of our You know, patients have lost their spouse, for example, which is a very, very tragic thing uh, to go through. But a lot of life transitions can happen in what we would term, you know, the older adult stage of life, you know, kind of beyond 65. And we need to acknowledge the questions that that brings up. Uh, You know, a lot of us, you know, maybe in our late 20s, 30s, 40s, we, we may not necessarily think about the implications of some of those transitions. But we have to acknowledge it. It really brings up uh, the questions of, you know, what is life about? What am I going to do now? What's the point of all this? Uh, that are very, very deep questions that our patients are grappling with. And the, the better I feel that we can understand those situations um, and understand what they're facing, the, the better off we'll be, you know, when we reach that point, at, at, you know, down the road. Um, but we'll be, better be able to serve them in a very helpful way and have some type of empathy to understand what, what they're going through. So I want to just kind of give a brief history of death and dying uh, in our kind of American context, because I find it pretty interesting. Um, So you all have heard of the five stages of grief. So DABDA, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. So that was coined um, by a Swiss-born psychiatrist, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She first introduced this concept in a book called On Death and Dying, which was published in 1969. I haven't read this book, but a lot of people that I really look up to have read it and said it's an amazing read. Um, But it basically stemmed from her seeing the huge contrast in how her homeland of Switzerland views and treats death and dying compared uh, to the U.S. 
So, you know, back at home in Switzerland, it, it was normal. People accepted that they are going to die. They talked about it. It was a part of their life. They knew you're born into this world and you're going to leave this world. And it wasn't this taboo subject that people kind of tiptoed around, but they they talked about it. They brought it to the table as compared to the, the U.S., especially, you know, when, you know, she was doing this work in the late 60s. You know, death was was not talked about. A lot of older adults are being institutionalized, pushed away. Uh, you just kind of in, into the fringes of society. And we were ignoring uh, aging. We were ignoring death. And she is one that really brought light to um, th this issue. And I want to read what her testimony was, because in, in 1972, uh, she testified at the first national hearing on the subject of death with dignity which was conducted by the U.S. Uh, Senate Special Committee on Aging. I'm just going to read this to you verbatim. So Kubler-Ross states, We live in a very particular death-denying society. We isolate both the dying and the old, and it serves a purpose. They are reminders of our own mortality. We should not institutionalize people. We can give families more help with home care and visiting nurses, giving the families and the patients the spiritual, emotional, and financial help in order to facilitate the final care at home. Now, if you hear that quote, one of the first things that may come to mind for many of you is, oh, well, she's talking about hospice and palliative care. But at that moment, that wasn't a thing. Hospice was not on anyone's radar. Um, and she was really a pioneer in, in getting that to, to become an actual uh, you know, service that we provide. I mean, there's many other uh, people that were in kind of that hospice movement for sure. But I do want to highlight uh, her work and really bring to light you know, how how are we caring for people that are, are on their deathbed? They're actively dying um, because it was not a, a very, very good uh, system before, you know, kind of hospice and palliative care came around. And so that was kind of uh, that kind of really spoke loudly um, and helped create hospice and palliative care as we know it today. But a lot of us don't really you know work in that world. We're not familiar with hospice. We're not familiar with palliative care. I had no freaking clue you know, what the specifics were until, you know, I was in home health where some hospice agencies will contract out to physical therapists for a couple of visits. So the big question that, that I typically ask or people that often uh, think about is what's the difference between hospice and palliative care? Um, so I just went on medlineplus.gov, which is kind of the government's medical information site. And the big difference, so both palliative care and hospice care provide comfort, but palliative care can begin at diagnosis and at the same time as treatment. So hospice care begins after treatment of the, of the disease is stopped and when it is clear that the person is not going to survive the illness. Hospice care is usually offered only when the person is expected to live six months or less. Now, I want you to understand that you as a physical therapist can work in those particular situations. It is very challenging. It's very heavy. It's very weighty. Uh, but it will be one of the most rewarding uh, arenas that you can work in. Uh, there are hospice agencies that will contract out to home health clinicians and, you know, they'll typically give us a few visits. Um, but those have been some of the most transformative patient interactions that I've had uh, throughout my, my short career thus far. And so I wanted to share, um, you know, just a few lessons based on those interactions and, and just spending time in people's homes that, you know, are, you know, upper 80s, upper 90s, you know, over 100. Um, because those are some very precious moments that have informed me, you know, tremendously. So we're just going to kind of go through this list here and just kind of give you some insights uh, gleaned from those experiences. So the first thing, and this was informed by those experiences, but then also by Atul Gawande, and I'm going to mention his book and a few other books at the end of this uh, end of this podcast. But he has said the best way to talk about dying is to talk about living. So Atul Gawande is a, is a physician, um, but his big critique of the American kind of healthcare system is that it's been so focused on battling death and not prizing life that we are trying to just push death away, you know, prolong death, you know, push, push, push. But we're not necessarily talking about how to really prize and best utilize the life that, that we do have. And from the physical therapist standpoint, we have to prize life. We have to have those conversations with a lot of our patients of what do you want to be able to do? What does a good day look like? What are you having trouble with now? And how can we work together to get you to the point where you're able to achieve that, that specific goal? What, what we need to talk about the life that is ahead. What do they want out of that life? A lot of times that conversation is not happening, 
but we as PTs can be having that conversation with our pa patients and we can form our plans of care uh, around that to best serve them and help them have a good experience even all the way uh, towards the end. The second thing uh, that, that I've you know, realized and read as well is that the closer that some of our patients get uh, you know, to their deathbed, quote unquote, is that the more their priorities change. So I've had several patients where um, you know, they had some type of uh, you know, cancer diagnosis that we were still unsure if it was terminal, if, if it was progressing rapidly. Um, at first, you know, we were working on goals that related around getting back in the garden, you know, walking around the community, getting back to, uh, you know, a, a normal life for them. Um, but then as soon as they got, you know, some type of news as their, their cancer progressed um, or, you know, th things just weren't looking that great, their priorities started to, to shift a little bit. It went from trying to be able to, you know, work on their, their famous rose bush that the whole neighborhood loves to, you know, just being able to get off the toilet, you know, being able to, you know, read a book, being able to, you know, get out of the chair without having to call someone to help. And if you as a physical therapist aren't attuned to that shift in priorities, you are doing a disservice to your patients. You may be still trying to push your goals or what you think that patient uh, wants, but in reality, their priorities have completely changed. And sometimes the patients won't even tell you that because they'll view it as, you know, they're giving up. Uh, which, you know, that's not the case at all. Priorities just change and we can honor that, but you're not going to be able to honor that if you're not having some type of conversation uh, with your patient. So acknowledge that priorities can change and it can change in a doctor visit by one sentence that that physician would, would give uh, your patient, you know, maybe about some bad news. So, so acknowledge that, ask those questions, be, have your plan of care in an open hand and know that those goals can shift uh, relatively quickly. The third thing, um, we need to honor our patient's dignity. So I, I mentioned this a few, few times on, on this podcast, but I know for, for me, I want to impose what I think the patient can do uh, onto them. So let's say I know that they may be able to do a you 26-pound know, goblet kettlebell or a goblet squat with a kettlebell, um, but they may not want to do that. That may not necessarily correlate to some of their goals that may be completely different from the goals that I may have for that patient. I need to honor the dignity of that person. I mean, we could say it's for all of our patients for sure, um, but I feel like this is super important with some of our patients that are really grappling with death and, and dying. Um, honor their dignity, uh, respect them, respect their choices, and, and shape our plans of care uh, around that. And then lastly, we need to be talking about this stuff ourselves. We need to be thinking about death dying. We need to be putting ourselves in, in the shoes of our patients. I mean, I, I, it's a painful, painful thing to think about, you know, me losing my spouse right now, uh, you know, my, my friends and family passing away, me not being able to do a job that I love and transitioning into this next phase of life. It's painful to think about that. And some of you all listening have gone through some of those transitions. And I know it's not, it's not easy, but the more that we think about this, we talk about this, uh, we're going to have a better sense of, of empathy for our patients to be able to serve them when they're going through some of these tough transitions. It is so easy for us. And I'm, I'm mainly talking to a lot of the younger PTs, the fresh PTs, people that have only been out maybe for less than a decade. You know, we're, we're kind of in, in the prime of life, as, as some would say. A lot of things are going well. Uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of life to look uh, forward to that we often push something like death and dying off to the side. We'll, we'll think about that when that time comes. Um, but what I would argue is that the sooner that we can really, um, you know, have, a, you know, some serious conversations, you know, with ourselves, some, some time to think about death and dying on the front end, the better that will serve us on the back end, uh, that we will be probably healthier uh, in terms of, you know, our ability to accept some of this news, but we'll better be able to serve our patients that are going through some of this stuff. Um, and that's, that's what I think is really important. We need to serve our patients well. Uh, throughout the whole lifespan, but in particular, uh, when someone, you know, is is really grappling with death and dying, uh, we need to take that very seriously and see how we uh, can serve them well. So some some would say that, uh, you know, talking about death and dying and talking about some of the issues that are, you know, particularly related to older adults, if, if you are becoming well-versed in such topics, you are considered an old person in training. So that was termed by Ashton Applewhite. Uh, she wrote the book, This Chair Rocks. Um, but I like to think about that. We're all old people in training, uh, whether physically, you know, by, you know, resistance training, weight training, you know, staying, staying healthy, 
uh, eating well, all those things. And we are preparing ourselves for uh, becoming older adults. But even talking about difficult subjects like this one, death and dying, and you can become an old person in training. So I want to mention a few books. If this topic makes you uncomfortable, uh, if you don't talk about this a lot with you know some of your patients or even think about it yourself, I want to recommend three books. Um, two of which I've read, one of which I have not read, which, you know, you're not supposed to recommend a book that you haven't read. Uh, but a lot of really smart people that I respect, uh, have said good things and it's on my, uh, reading list. So the first one is this one, when breath becomes air, uh, this is written by, it was, I believe he is a neurosurgeon, neurosurgery resident, and he, uh, had a terminal illness. Um, but he, he penned the book himself as, you know, he was actively dying. And the perspectives from the medical side of things was very interesting, but just the perspective of, of death and dying as he was kind of, you know, wrestling with some of these issues himself was an absolutely fascinating read. The second book, This Chair Rocks by Ashton Applewhite. She is kind of the pioneer uh, in the fight against ageism. Uh, amazing woman in New York City. I've got to interview her and she she's an amazing person to talk with. But that book is a very entertaining read, but she addresses ageism and a lot of the issues that we talk about with older adults on many different levels. Uh, really entertaining book, uh, you know, relatively easy and quick read, uh, This Chair Rocks. And then last but not least, one that you all are probably most familiar with is Atul Gawande's Being Mortal. Um, I, I can't say much about the book, uh, but I've listened to any podcast that he's on uh, and any blog post that he's done, and it's been solid in terms of his perspective. He spent a lot of time uh, with people um, that are actively, you know, dying that they, uh, you know, their pers their perspectives, their wishes, all these things. And he's kind of pinned a book uh, with a collection of all those thoughts. So, all right, death and dying. I know it's a fun one, uh, but we need to talk about it. So you all uh, check the Facebook post. I'm going to put links to those different books. Um, and if you want to hop in the next cohort of modern management of the older adult, June 12th is when we're starting. Uh, this course is really taking shape to be something uh, really awesome in terms of, uh, you know, how we are basically building on the last week. So it's it's case based and we just keep building and building and building and building uh, to where it's really taking shape to where it's almost like we're, we're telling a story. And at the end, you know, you, you have a, a great example of how you can apply a lot of these principles uh, to your older adult patients. So hop in that PT on dot com. Check the link to the books in the Facebook post. And I'll talk to y'all soon. Hit me. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, go to ptonice.com, click on the courses tab, and check out Modern Management of the Older Adult. This is a course that myself and Christina Previtt are going to be teaching. It's eight weeks, an online format, interactive, and solely focused on helping students change how they practice and how they work with older adults. For more information, just go to ptonice.com. Thanks.